It's the dictionary. 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 Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Uh, still doing video, and I'm trying something new. I decided because I got one of those external webcamies. Uh, I said, why can't I just put it on the book? So it is now sitting on top of the book, so uh, you don't have to look at my hair so much. It's not the best angle. I'm looking at it at the monitor there. So, you know, it's a little under me, but hopefully it's a better, better view of my face. I don't know. This is a little bit weird. It's kind of dark. If I turn on the light, it gets kind of weird. Get the things in my glasses. I don't know. It's an experiment. Let's see how it works. The first word, oh, let's quickly say, please, 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 please rate and review this show. Put all that information out there. Give it the five stars. Apple Podcasts is a great place to do that. Share this show with all the people you know. Subscribe to it. Uh, please join the Patreon if you want to give me as little as $1 a month. That'll get you uh, early episodes. And then, then of course, there's uh, some exclusives if you go up to $5 a month. Uh, what else? Uh, merchandise. You can buy merchandise for this show. There is a Public link in the show notes. And uh, Jonah and Tom made the theme songs. And what are some other things? Oh, gee, obviously, got to talk about social media. Uh, at Dictionary Pod, we got Instagram, we got Twitter, we got Threads. I don't know. I don't care. All these things is making it very complicated to put this stuff out there. Not many people even look at it anyway. Uh, and then email. If you want to contact me via email, dictionarypod at gmail.com. Um, uh, I still would like to do this thing. If you come up with a joke of some kind for any word in the future, all the way through the end of the alphabet, go ahead and email me the joke. Let me know uh, if I can credit you, how I can credit you. I will read your joke when I get to that word. Uh, and then I think the last thing is the Google Voice number, 917-727-5757. I think. Check the show notes. Call it, leave a voicemail. I would love to put it in an episode if uh, somebody called and left a voicemail. I think that's good for now. Okay, the first word in this episode is adductor. E-D-U-C-T-O-R. Eductor. Eductor. Noun from 1796. The synonym is the number two definition for the word ejector. So maybe this is like... You're in a James Bond car, and you got an ejector seat. It can also be called an eductor seat. Or maybe this is something different. I don't know. We'll find out in the EJ section. Ooh, I gotta make a sound effect. Let's go. Oh, I didn't even notice this when I was looking at the words at the, at the start. This is my word. This is one of my favorite words. Edutainment. <laughs> You could also just say edutainment, edutainment, however you want to say it. Oh, this might be the word of the episode. Edutainment, noun from 1973. I might need to do a little digging to, digging to see when uh, edutainment came into being in 1973. What were they talking about? It is entertainment that is designed to be educational. Or maybe it is educational content that is designed to be a little entertaining. I don't think I'm the most entertaining. I'm not a comedian. I would love to do some comedy stuff, acting and stand-up, but I don't. my brain doesn't work quite the same way that like most uh, comedians do uh, or, or entertainers. But, you know, I, I'd like to be kind of entertaining. Hopefully this is semi-entertaining. Uh, I had to make sure everything was recording. Good, it is. So, uh, entertainment. But what types of entertainment are we talking about? It says games, films, or shows. So, a game, you can have an entertaining game, but you're also learning at the same time. That's so much fun. Films or shows. Uh, those are typically pretty entertaining, but if you can learn something at the same time, that's great. Maybe a documentary, a very entertaining documentary 
uh, that's going to teach you some stuff. That could be edutainment, edutainment, edutainment. <laughs> I was about to sing a song, but maybe I should hold off until later. Edutainment, edutainment, that's what we're here for, edutainment. Did you learn something from that? No. Uh, this is obviously from the words education plus entertainment. This is the, the best things. I remember, I think maybe one of the first times I heard about edutainment was on uh, The Simpsons. Uh, the news, uh, Kent, Kent Brockman, I think, mentioned it on the news channel. Okay, what was my sound effect? <laughs> Something like that. Next is Edwardian or Edwardian with a capital E, capital E. It's like Edward and then Ian, Edward Ian. <laughs> That's how you spell Edwardian. Adjective from 1908 of relating to or characteristic of Edward VII of England or his age. His age, like is that just his time period, his literal age, or the time period that he was? I'm not sure, but I think it's the time period. Especially, oh, we're talking about of clothing here in this especially thing. Marked by the hourglass silhouette for women and long, narrow, fitted suits and high collars for men. So I'm guessing that's a lot of what they were wearing during Edward VII's age. In England, and so that those clothes are uh, are Edwardian. Do are people still wearing Edwardian clothes? Um, are we what now, what what time period is this? 1908 was was Edward the Seventh of England in 1908? I gotta I gotta do a little digging on this one too. Edwardian is also a noun. Um, it's so fascinating that. This this thing, this this time period, these clothes are named after the time that this one guy was ruling England. I assume he was the king. I don't know my my British uh, kings and queens and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I mean, not everybody gets something named after them like that. Hmm. That was the end of the ED section. <laughs> Next is EE, all caps, abbreviation for electrical engineer. Some very smart people figuring out how to engineer electricity. I can't even fathom how, it's just, there's lots of studying. You got to be real careful and real smart. They probably get shocked every day, at least at the beginning. EE <laughs> -E again, this is a suffix. And uh, we got two forms. There's no EE -E prefix. That would be an interesting word, an interesting concept. But there's nothing like that. So, EE -E suffix. First form, uh, no year, number one. It means recipient or beneficiary of. Of what? Of a specified action. So an action happens, and then the person who is... Uh, benefiting from that action, receiving from that action, uh, they are the something e. What what examples do we have? We have appointee. If you have been appointed, you've been pointed at, you are the pointee. And then also grantee. Something is being granted to you. Maybe it's uh, bonds. Bonds, sure. Number two, person. <laughs> Uh, I was losing my place here. Per person furnished with. Furnished with what? A specified thing. As in, patentee. So, they have been given a patent, I guess? Yes, they have been furnished with a patent, a specific thing. Patentee. Maybe they, they were trying to get a patent. They invented something. And now they got their patent. Congratulations! Yay! If I want to do hand movements, I got to keep them close, it, right in right in this area, that area. Uh, number three, person that performs performs what? Performs a specific action, as in hoo 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 escapee. So they uh, th they're performing a very specific action. They are escaping. 
I, I think if you were um, if you were kidnapped and you escaped, uh, I guess you would be called an escapee. But I don't know if they would. I, I don't know. It just seems. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, the, the doing a specific action, um, the escapee. I can't think of any other examples. If you are if you are a cooker, you are a cookie. No, you are a, a, a you're not that. That's not that's not how this goes. I mean, I guess it could. A person that performs a specified action. Any action. Hmm. Uh, The etymology doesn't really give us much, so let's move on. The second form of the EE suffix. This one, um, number one, one associated with. And the example is bargee. Bargee? One associated with what a barge are you associated with a barge those big old boats on the on the water or is this or or are you barging into a room uh that one i'm a little confused a bargee one associated with i don't know number two a particular especially small kind of of what a thing just the thing that you were talking about that's where you, you put this suffix on as in Booty, B-O-O-T-E-E, a particular, especially small kind of. So is this a just a little tiny boot? Maybe it's a boot. Maybe it's oh, cowboy boots for babies. Is that a booty? Small kind of a thing is a booty. Oh, just a, an E. You put the E-E at the end. What are some other things? A, I can't think of anything in the moment. <laughs> I can never think of anything in the moment. Number three, one resembling or suggestive of. The example here is goatee. So if I shaved the rest of my beard, left the mustache, left the chin, the chin part, uh, I have done this, uh, that would be a goatee because it is resembling or suggestive of a goat. You look like a goat, that is a goatee. That is why we put the EE at the end of goatee. Uh, it just says it's probably an alternative of the Y suffix, just the letter Y. Similar, similar sound, yeah. <laughs> EEC, all caps, abbreviation for European Economic Community. The whole community of economics in Europe. <laughs> EEG, abbreviation for. It's a f- couple of fun words to say, which we will get to uh, someday. Electro, I lost my place. Electroencephalogram. I think I got that right. The other word is electroencephalograph. Hmm. Graph and gram. I wonder if they're the same thing, just with different different words, basically. Oh, we're gonna learn all about the electro words later. <laughs> Ooh, this is a fun word. Eek. E-E-K. It's an interjection from 1951. This is used to express surprise or dismay. Surprise. I'm sad. Eek. Eek. I uh, I actually used this in a text recently. Don't remember what the context was. Somebody said something, and I said eek because I thought it was appropriate. I was either surprised or dismayed. Uh, that is a good word. This next one is also a good word. Some people, it will freak some people out. Eel. E-E-L. Noun from before the 12th century. I feel like there should be, you know, there's the, uh, there's that, um, I don't know if it's, if they still make it, that laundry detergent, all, and then their, their song was A-L-L, I think. And now I want there to be like a sketch parody of that just eel so it's a fabric softener laundry detergent called eel e-e-l and then you just pour it in it's just eels that go into your laundry and they clean them somehow i don't know how they do it but they do it 1a any of numerous voracious elongate snail snake like bony fishes that have a smooth (laughs) slimy skin (laughs) They lack pelvic fins, oh, that's very sad, and have the median fins 
confluent around the tail. And it says compared to the synonym American eel. Or maybe it's not a synonym. I don't know. American eel. Yeah, those American eels are carrying American flags and have big trucks and shoot guns. Can you draw that for me, please? Uh, okay, the order name for these eels, just the general idea of an eel, is Anguilliformes. Anguilliformes, I think that's close enough. Uh, yes, they are very elongate because they are snake-like, and they have <laughs> sl smooth and slimy skin. How can you tell about their skin when you're underwater? Can you can you tell the difference between something slimy and something not slimy when you're petting it underwater? I never pet an eel. I pet a dolphin. They're not slimy. Okay, 1B, any of numerous other elongate fishes, as of the order Synbranchiformes. Syn Synbranchiformes. So I guess these are just different types of fishes that are elongate, maybe also kind of snake-like. And uh, but I guess they're not technically eels, but they call them eels. So we can we just call them eels? I don't know. I don't know what the difference is. Number two, any of various nematodes, as the vinegar eel. The vinegar eel. What the? F what is the vinegar eel? And it's a nematode. That's a whole different thing, I guess. Hmm. Eel-like is an adjective, and eely. Eely is also an adjective. Ooh, that snake is so eely. Obviously, I got to post a picture of an eel or a couple of them on social media. Uh, not everybody might want to see it, but uh, I think that they're uh, fun looking and interesting. And uh, yeah, and also creepy. Not going to lie. Creepy faces on the eels. This is from, uh, goes back to the old high German Al, A-L, and that means eel. So it, eel just means eel. It's an interesting word. <laughs> eel grass is next. One word, noun from 1790. One, a submerged, long-leaved, monocotyledon. I hate it when they long these long friggin' words go over to the second line. You're making it that much more difficult for me. I, it can't be helped, I guess. Monocotyledonous marine plant. Submerged in the water, long leaves. Monocotyledonous marine plant that is found especially in coastal temperate waters and whose dried stems and leaves are used especially as packing material in woven goods. Hmm. That is fascinating. Uh, let's see, the, the, uh, what is this? The species name is Zostera marina. So I'm guessing that the leaves are, they look kind of eel-like or eely, and that's why they call it eelgrass, because it's a plant, and it's got these long, long leaves. Wow! Okay, uh, number two. Number two for eelgrass, the synonym is tape grass. So I guess this is grass that maybe looks like strings of tape. Uh, like scotch tape? Sure, why not? <laughs> Next is eel pout. One word, E-E-L-P-O-U-T, noun from before the 12th century. One, any of various elongate tapered marine fishes usually living on the bottom of cold seas. I guess they like the cold water, and they like to live at the bottom, because there's probably more creatures, maybe crawly creatures, live down there that they can eat. The family name is Zoracidae. I'm not sure. Zoarcidae. Z-O-A-R-C-I-D-A-E. Zoracidae. And number two, the synonym is burbot, or burbot, B-U-R-B-O-T. That is eel pout. What was that? The problem with having this camera here right on the book is that if I wanted to go back on pages this way, 
on this earlier, I can't really do that so good because it's going to move the camera. I can check this side, but then if I do it, it might cover the book, and that's not good. Okay. Ooh, even better. Eelworm. One word, noun from 1888. A nematode worm, especially any of various small free-living or plant parasitic roundworms. Ah, no, no, thanks, no. It's bad enough that it's an eel and a worm, and then it's like a worm inside your body, parasitic. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Next. Een, E-E-N, this is a suffix. And again, no year. I don't know why the suffixes and the prefix almost never have a year. That seems odd to me. This in suffix is means inferior fabric resembling. What? Inferior fabric resembling. Resembling what? A specified fabric. Inferior fabric that resembles a specified fabric. Also, it means imitation. As in the example, hmm, <laughs> ah, I never knew this or thought about this. Velveteen. Can we only use this when we're talking about fabric? Can we use it when we're talking about other things? I guess not, just fabric. So velveteen is, I guess, imitation velvet. You know, people who work with fabric all the time clearly already knew this. I don't work with fabric, so I didn't know this. I do love the feel of velvet. Uh, so, but it's inferior. I'm sorry. It's just inferior. It's just not as good as the real stuff. Velveteen. There's the velveteen rabbit. What if we lived in a world where there was no imitation velvet, so it was just the velvet rabbit? That's That sounds like a very fancy rabbit made out of velvet. Everybody loves this velvet. They just love to rub their hands on the, on the rabbit's skin because it feels so nice. Velveteen. I got to go find some velveteen and, and figure out. Can, can, I, can I figure out? Can I, when I touch it, will it feel inferior? Maybe. This next one is also pronounced een. It is spelled e apostrophe e n, e apostrophe e n. You say een, and this is an adverb from circa 1553, and the synonym it just means even. So I think that probably they use this in uh, maybe poetry. If you want to say even, but you don't but you want to stick with your syllables. Maybe you only want one syllable here, but you want to say even, you can just say een. And then, but you got to put the apostrophe so you know that you've you've removed a letter. You've excised that letter. You could get it from context, I guess. Yeah, they do this a lot uh, in poetry. Um, i trying to think of other examples. I've seen, I can't think of any. Next. <laughs> We got more ab abbreviations, E-E-N-T, all caps. Abbreviation for, this is probably for a doctor situation, eye, ear, nose, and throat. Eyes and ears and nose and throat. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Hey! <laughs> E-E-O, all caps. Abbreviation for equal employment opportunity. Everybody should have the opportunity to go work wherever they want to work. None of this, uh, you can't work here. It's just everybody. That's it's a good uh, opportunity organization, I guess. I think. It's, is it organization? What is it? I don't know. <laughs> EEOC, all caps. Abbreviation for equal. Oh, ho, here we go. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's a commission. I, are there people who, who work at this place? Uh, full time. What what do they do? What's their job like? They got to do something. They're the ones who are making sure that the uh, everybody's got the opportunity for equal employment. <laughs> this is a long abbreviation. E E P R O M. E P R O M. E P R O M. All caps. Abbreviation for electronically erasable, programmable, read only memory. And I have no idea how that gets used in context. Where are we using this? 
electronically erasable programmable read-only memory. So it's memory that you can only read it. You can't write to it. You can't change it. It's programmable. If it's programmable, how can you only read it? Maybe it was programmed first. It's erasable. That doesn't seem like read-only. I'm getting a lot of mixed signals here from EEPROM. And it's electronic. Yeah, that's weird. We have another suffix, E-E-R, ear. Noun, noun suffix. Uh, and it means one that is concerned with professionally... What? Professionally conducts or produces. Wow, that is not how... My brain does not want to read that as a normal sentence. One that is concerned with concerned with professionally conducts or produce I don't understand this sentence but the example we have a couple of them auctioneer so the auctioneer is auctioning off the items and they are concerned with professionally con conducts or conducts and produces so they're producing things conducting thing and they're professional I'm not why does my brain not understand this sentence the other example is pamphleteer. So this is probably somebody who's just passing out pamphlets all the time. And this is often in words with derogatory meaning. This is an additional thing to the definition, uh, as in profiteer. So that's would that would be somebody who's just trying to profit off of everything, I guess. And you know, there's more to it than that, I'm sure. Uh, so it's it's often used in words with a derogatory meaning hmm that's interesting that it's, it's so common are our auctioneers derogatory no i don't think so i don't think pamphleteers are derogatory either that is an interesting one uh i guess there's more at the suffix a r y i don't remember that one Okay, so we have one more word. It's very similar to a previous one. Before we had in, uh, that was the adverb with the apostrophe, and now we have, how do you pronounce this, air? I think I think you pronounce it air. It is e, apostrophe, er, adverb, again, from the 13th century, and this one means, uh, the synonym is ever. This is probably... More commonly used than even, although, I don't know, how often are you saying ever compared to even in poetry? I don't know. Probably pretty close. We're not going to get into the specifics of how often words are used in poetry, in prose. But this one, I in my mind, I feel like I've probably seen it more. And I do not read poetry. So if you want to say ever, oh, it was, it was, it was, it was, I don't know words. Uh, so you want to say ever, and then you just say air. Ever. Ever. But you can't say the V. You can't make it two syllables. It's got to be one syllable because the prose, the poetry, has very specific syllables that you're writing. And so you just say air. There's some context, uh, some famous line probably, and I don't know it. All right, now is the time that I re read the word so I can read, I can tell you the word of the episode. So we had eductor, edutainment, Edwardian, E-E, E-E, E-E-C, -E -E E-E-G, eek. I like that word. Eel, eelgrass, eel pout, eel worm, een, een, E-E-N-T, E-E-O, E-E-O-C, E-prom, ear, and air. Obviously, I'm going to pick edutainment as the word of the episode. I don't know how you want to pronounce it. Whatever way you want is fine. And this show is edutainment. It's edutainment so through and through. You're getting educated and you're also being entertained by me, Spencer, the edutainment master. <laughs> All right, that was fine. I just like to have fun with the things and the words and the singing and the goofiness. That's all life is supposed to be. Don't you think? I think so. Something else that is fun and goofy is uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I'm talking about movies now. Uh, I believe that's the next one I'm on. 
Uh, I had seen this movie m- m- multiple times when I was a young lad. It came out when I was nine, almost ten. I remember uh, I was at camp. I was at a, like an eight-week camp, uh, overnight camp. My mom was working there, so you know it was a fun arts camp. My dad came to visit for the weekend, and I remember being in uh, getting lunch or dinner or something with my dad, and he said that I think he said that he either saw last crusade or we were talking about how it had just come out and of course i was at camp so i didn't get to see it but i'm pretty sure right after camp we went and saw it or maybe i went and saw it during camp i don't remember um but it starts off with young indiana jones and i never put this connection together until sharon came into my life but it uh, he's played by river phoenix and my wife sharon has always been a huge huge river phoenix fan so when we decided to rewatch. Uh, the Last Crusade, getting ready for the fifth one, uh, which just came out, which we did see, uh, she reminded me that she had never seen the entire movie because she had only watched the first part with River Phoenix countless times. Who knows how many times? Could have just been five. I don't know. I hope she doesn't mind me telling the story. I just think it's very cute and sweet that she was like, nope, I don't even need to see the rest of the movie. I just love R- River Phoenix so much. And, you know, you can't blame can't blame her. He's very cute for, uh, you know, a teenage girl. She would have been, yeah, she wasn't quite teenage. But, you know, he, he was big, popular at the time. And uh, and he's vegan and she was vegan. And, you know, there was it just she just very much appreciated his uh, lifestyle of being kind to everything and animals and all that. So uh, it makes sense. And uh, yeah, the movie is fun. The movie is so much fun and funny. Sean Connery coming in. They they had some great banter. Um, yeah, I just remember a lot of that movie very fondly because I was like nine or ten when it came out. And everything from that time, I remember fondly. Every single moment. That is the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this weird camera angle isn't too weird. I got to figure something else out, I think. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye.